spending most of the year in critical condition, the biotech sector has suddenly started showing some signs of life over the past six weeks. This whole group is in the doghouse because investors were terrified by all those proposals coming out of the Democratic primary, most of which would make it harder for the drug industry to make money. But in recent weeks, it started feeling that maybe those fears are in the are behind us? I don't know, but the group's been able to rally. Look at Biomarine Pharmaceutical. It's a company that makes orphan drugs. That's super expensive treatments for rare conditions that affect fairly small numbers of people but wouldn't be treated otherwise. For months, Biomarine stock got hammered, falling from about $100 back in February down to 63 that's lows last month. Since then, the stock's come roaring back, climbing to 75 as of today. Some of that's because the biotechs feel less toxic. Some of it's because Biomarine reported a good quarter three weeks ago. Earlier today, Biomarine held its R&D event, which is much lower forward to. They gave us a positive update on one of their lead drug candidates, a phase two treatment for, here we go, I got to try to get these right, achondroplasia, plesha, which is the most common cause of dwarfism in humans. So can this stock keep rebounding? Let's check in with JJ Bianamese, the chairman and CEO of Biomarin. Get a better sense of how his company's doing and where it's headed. Mr. Bianami, welcome back to Mad Money. Okay, Thank you. Me. Great to see you. Thank you. Great yeah, to see you. you. JJ, I'm hearing some staggeringly positive uh, gains in height. From yeah. this drug, uh, not really conceivable even just a few years ago. So tell us about that because it could be. Really so again, yeah, we uh, so at R&D Day today in New York, we gave this update uh, on uh, now four and a half years uh, of treatments of those patients, and we were able to show that they gain uh, over those four and a half years of treatment nine centimeters in growth, which is pretty substantial for those right. patients because they are, uh, you know, most patients with this condition. Uh, their final adult height is around four uh, feet for, right. for males. Uh, there are five standard deviations from patients with average height. So this is pretty significant. Although, and although we're using height or gross velocity as an endpoint, this is uh, going to very likely substantially improve their quality of life because they have all sorts of you know, uh, morbidity right. associated with their, their stature and spinal cord compressions, all sorts of issues that we hope to be able to to improve. Now, you also uh, gave us a picture of a drug called Valrox. Or, yes, yes. And that was something that you had spoken to us, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year and a half ago. And yes. it sounds like the news is good. So we made great progress there. And uh, we are uh, very confident that we will be uh, submitting uh, for filing for approval in the US and in Europe before the end of this year, so in the next six And the results days. are good. Well, we, so we had phase two data where we showed that the drug uh, last May was working for at least three years in terms of controlling bleeding episodes. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, good uh, early phase three data. So we're filing with a uh, uh, preliminary filing with just a subset of the phase three patients. Uh, right. But based on our interactions with the regulatory authorities, we should be able to get approval for the drug. Now, this is severe uh, hemophilia A. Is that, hemophilia that's a, a bigger drug than typical for bio. Yes, that's about 125,000 patients in the world. So that's bigger than that's what we've big. done. Yeah. So. Now, the reason I, I, I think this is so important is because, meanwhile, the seven approved products targeted to deliver $2 billion in revenue, you got the most, maybe the most stable uh, of, of just a continual roadmap of where you're going. So these could be big kickers for you. No, you're right. So that's why, that's why we, I announced this morning at the R&D Day that actually, we, based on recent data, we are more and more confident on the durability of effect of both Vosoritide for achondroplasia and Valrox for gene therapy for hemophilia A. And consequently, we said we are you know, more and more confident about reaching $2 billion in revenues next year. Right. And for the first time, and you probably didn't see that, we announced that we will be very likely gap profitable right. for the first no, time you, you, I was, next you year. talked a lot about uh, cost control. Okay. I've never really cared about that for you, but I know mm. the market's changed. Yes. And they want you to do that. I wanted the growth, but yes. you've uh, addressed these issues that they want. Exactly. And specifically now, uh, you know, with the anticipated approval of Valorox and Bazaritai, we should see a significant acceleration of the top line, you know, beyond right. $2 billion. Um, and uh, because we've been growing about 15% per year over the past you know, three to four years, we should see an inflection point growing even faster beyond $2 billion. And then obviously, the, then we should see the profitability of the company uh, improve substantially again, assuming well, those two patients. I think that's terrific because I was looking at the stock. Since 2013, it's up about 8%. But this is what's so weird for me. Revenues in 2013, 549 million. Uh, now you're talking about $2 billion. The market does not know how to value your company. How could a company? How could you have four times the revenues and be the stock the same price? And I think the answer is is either they're looking for profitability or they're worried about a change in how much people are compensated 
for developing amazing drugs. I mean, it's a, combi it's a combination of both. And it it's is. also probably because four years ago, you know, the stock was probably a little ahead of itself. Right, well. Uh, and, and now, you know, this, this pendulum swings one way or the other. Uh, but I would say uh, the good news is that, you know, our products have a very long life cycle. We have no, those, the six products we have on the market in the U.S. have no competition. They are the only product approval for the indication that they treat. Uh, so, so we have, you know, sustainability of our revenues that's pretty important here. And despite all the headlines, you know, our pricing in the U.S. has not been affected by all the, the headlines about pricing so far. Uh, and also compared to many other big pharma companies, our price outside the U.S. Uh, actually pretty similar to the price we're charging oh, the U.S. Oh, so no government. one feel okay, because the oh. politicians always say, well, if we had been to Spain, if we yes. went to France, yeah. went to Italy. Yeah. So it is, okay, so there's no comparison that makes your pricing look wrong here. So actually, we looked at the basket of countries that are being used, you know, sure. for pricing comparison. And, and if we look at the price on average that we pay, uh, that we charge in those countries compared to the U.S. government price, mm -hmm. where there are some discount, it's about the same. Well, you know, look, so. this is, I don't understand the math. I do understand yeah. the, I don't understand the science, candidly, but yeah. I do understand a stock that is inexpensive versus where it has been. Yes. And therefore, it's a terrific idea. That's J.J. Benjamin, Chairman and CEO of Biomarin. You can, the deck is very clear for those of you who try to say, listen, I don't understand this. They have a global leader in rare disease therapies that is really helpful for anyone who wants to know more. And you should know more before you buy the stock. Mad Money's back after the break. Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.